Greetings once again, AP Couch and Saving Student, Mr. Record with the on High School, and we are going to jump right into topic 3.4 uh, in Unit 3 of the College Board AP Calculus AP New Curriculum and Exam Description. And this particular topic will cover the differentiation of inverse trigonometric functions. And although this is a, a fairly small emphasized uh, part of the AP exam, I think it's something that probably every good calculus student should be somewhat aware of. And it typically wraps up the sort of the last frontier of, of the derivatives that a student would be expected to know in, um, in, in a calculus course really at, at any level. And as you can see here in the notes that we're using here in um, our particular class, uh, I have two different boxes here and I want to I guess draw the attention first of all to the box to the right. And those would be the six uh, basic inverse trigonometric function derivatives. And as you can see they are a little bit more involved, maybe a little bit unexpected. Uh, lots of components, lots of things going on. And then you jump over and over here to the blue box and hopefully you see that these are just the chain rule versions which essentially are the same thing with just that extra component of having to multiply your response by a, a derivative of the u. And of course the u is taking the place of the x. So it, it's it's not factual in any sense of the word that you would have to memorize 12 new derivative formulas. In fact, you, you could probably get by with saying that you only need to memorize three of these. And I say that by having to look at this first column here in the green box, and I call these the derivatives of the arc sine, arc tan, arc secant. And if you look at their counterparts in the right column, we're just taking the der derivatives of the arc cosine, arc cotangent, and arc cosecant, respectively. And you'll notice something very much in common with the two formulas. They are essentially the same expression, albeit with a negative sign in the right column. And I want you to make sure that you are all aware of the fact that there is a typo in the notes here. That should be a negative within that particular formula. So, long story short, any type of inverse trig word that begins with the letter C can be construed as a negative answer. And that doesn't really stray much from the derivatives of cosine and cotangent and cosecant, who also have negative answers. So the bottom line, if you can memorize these three, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Now, there is a way out if a student has maybe some difficulty memorizing these. And that's what our first little activity here is, the think about it activity. And it says, well, if you let y equal arc sine of x, how could we find the derivative of y with respect to x without using an inverse trigonometric function? And the answer to that is to certainly take yourself out of the inverse trig world because if we don't know how to take that derivative, we need to leave that particular world. So you have to think about what could you do to this equation so that it no longer contained an inverse trigonometric operation. And the answer to that question is that you would take the sine of both sides. So the sine of the left side is the sine of y, and the sine of the right side would be the sine of the arc sine of x. And in this particular application, the sine and the arc sine do cancel each other out and we would end up with just simply x. So we stop at this expression, the sine of y is equal to x. Now the good thing about this is that we can continue and we can take a derivative of both sides of this equation. We do have the tools to do that. But in order to pull that off, because this y is not written explicitly by itself, we would have to use implicit differentiation. So kind of to outline what's going to happen, we would be taking the sine of y, its derivative with respect to x, and on the right side we'll be taking the derivative of x with respect to x. Now what that would give us is the cosine of y times the derivative of y with respect to x equivalent to 1. And then in our last step, we're going to divide both sides by the cosine. 
So we find ourselves looking at dy dx is equal to 1 over the cosine of y. Now, you might wonder, well, wait a minute. That is nowhere near the same as this expression that we were supposed to get. And the reason is because we are dealing with a, a, an expression that's written in terms of y, and that must be changed. So you might notice this little triangle that I've uh, placed here in the notes. If we go back to this relationship that we wrote earlier, the sine of y is equal to x, we can fashion together a, a, a right triangle with those uh, with attributes that will obey this particular equation, and that will allow us to figure out what that cosine of y value is. So to do that, we'll pick any one of these non-right angles to be our angle y. It doesn't matter which one. I'll choose the lower right corner. And if the sine of that angle is x, that means that the opposite leg has a value of x and the hypotenuse has a value of 1. Now, if we use the Pythagorean theorem, we know that x squared plus this other leg, I'll call it for right now, squared is going to be the same as 1 squared. Well, what that will mean is that that leg squared is just 1 minus x squared, or that leg that we're looking for is the square root of 1 minus x squared. So I know all three sides of the triangle at this point. And that's very important because the cosine of y is going to use that leg that we just found. We know that the cosine is equivalent to adjacent over hypotenuse. So that adjacent would be the square root of 1 minus x squared all over 1, which I'm not going to write. And we find that we have indeed discovered our wonderful relationship here. So you've got a way out if you don't happen to have the inverse trigonometric uh, functions um, memorized in terms of their derivatives. And I want you to know that this procedure will work in large part for each one of these problems. Even the arc secant, which has this strange little absolute value of x, which just has to be there because it's innately a part of the, of the domain restriction that must exist in, in order for this inverse to, to exist. So you could always discover these on your own. It's much easier, though, if you just apply the derivative. So I want to run through a couple of examples here with you um, here in example one. The first one is the derivative of the arc sine of 2x. Well, in this particular situation, we have a value 2x that we proclaim to be our u. And then in that process, we can take the derivative of u, which I could write as u prime just as easily. And then we know that we're going to actually utilize this particular definition of the derivative of arc sine. And instead of just relying straight up on the 1 over 1 minus x squared under a square root, we have something that's just a little bit more elaborate. It says to start with your u prime, which of course is 2, and then you would place that above the square root of 1 minus u squared. Well, since the u in this problem is 2x, squaring 2x will, of course, give us 4x squared. And that will be our final answer. Now, the longer method that I showed you a moment ago does apply even if you have a u value that's something besides x. So as you can see here that's outlined in the blue uh, text in the box, uh, taking the derivative of y equal arc sine of 2x first of all, requires us to leave the world of inverse sine, take the derivative of both sides with respect to x, get a very similar statement that we had before, and then this cosine of y value that we have here is going to be evaluated using some kind of an image, perhaps a triangle, uh, something with the, in the unit circle, and you end up getting this same exact answer that we had before. Let's look at b very quickly. b, we're taking the derivative of the arctangent of 3x. In this instance, u is going to be equal to 3x, which means that the u prime is equal indeed to 3. If we go ahead and take the formula into consideration, 
we're looking at the second formula in the first column. So we're going to have u prime on top. That would be a 3 on top. And then the denominator, 1 plus u squared, would be 1 plus the quantity 3x squared, which results in 1 plus 9x squared. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, I would invite you to take a look at a couple of other examples. Uh, we have part C and part D, which utilize um, the inverse tangent and the inverse secant. A uh, little bit more complex, but I would like you to try these on your own. And in class, we will discuss the solutions um, when we see each other. So, anyway, hope this helps, and I'll see you next time.